Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Ilinka, who is also going to uh, be presenting with me this evening. We're, we're going to take a book each. There's a linker there. Um, and these events are meant to be really informal. So if you want to, um, if there's anything you want to say, or if you want to get involved during the conversation, you're more than welcome to. I'm just sharing my screen here. So I think what I'd like to start off with is just um, give a little bit of back background about the Belfast Photo Factory. We are a group of photographic artists and um, our practice, our individual practice it, it is varied, we differ, but we share um, an interest in photo books. And we currently hold photo book conversations online and these events are meant to be informal and they're open to everybody. And if you're interested, you can follow us on Instagram at Belfast Photo Factory and you can see when our, when our events are being held. And the discussion group was instigated to celebrate photo books as physical, tangible objects. It's kind of ironic because we're now doing it online, but it's something that we started during COVID and it, it kind of, it gives us a wider reach um, and it kind of works. And we really want to bring together people who share an interest in the concept, the form and design of photo books and to encourage um, dialogue around these artworks and any narrative that they may illustrate. And the books we look at are chosen from our personal libraries. We also have access to the library at the Belfast School of Art, which is uh, in Ulster University and Sword Magazine as well. Um, and when we're looking at photo books, um, we look at them as a means of expression. And we think that everything in the book is there for a reason. And some of the things that make a book interesting as a whole concept are the things that, that we're likely to discuss. So we're not really going to be discussing catalogues or retrospective collections. We are more interested in the book design, the edit sequence, and how these components work together and aid the flow and rhythm of each book and also how the design extends the narrative. For example, um, is there tension or is there humour? And I think the books we'll look at this evening um, are probably a good example of how there's, there's two different narratives. Um, and some of the books that we've looked at in the past, for some reason, there we go. Um, I'll run through some of the books that we've looked at this year recently. So this is Red String by Yoshi Katsu Fuji. And when we're looking at the books, we'll look at the cover and the binding. Um, we'll look at text and the location of that text and the typeface. This is I Saw the Air Fly by Sikani Darkroom. And we'll consider the design elements. Sometimes the design is more complex. Sometimes it's very simple. This is still here by Vivian Rouge. And also the paper stock and the type of paper. Uh, this is I Don't Recognize Me in the Shadows by Thana Farrokh. And certain devices which are used to tell the story and perhaps control the pace of the narrative. Um, examples would be blank pages, spacing, image position, text, chapters, and even hidden images, for example, in this book, by Sophie Carl, she hides the images in between the binding of the pages. And we'll consider the sequence and the layout, the pairing of images, the color and the shape of images and how they work together. Um, in a photo book, we think that images aren't individual, they work together. This could mean they pull each other, pull apart from each other in the book. And um, what else? We'll consider repetition symbols and motifs which run through the work and finally we'll look at the edit and how all of these different components work together to create this work of art. Um, generally the books we look at exist independently, independently of exhibitions but um, some books actually translate well from, from book form to the gallery walls and I think Pacifico Silano's book I wish I never saw the sunshine is a good example of that. 
as is um, Sophie Cole's book as well. The way she she displays this work in the gallery is is a good fit with the way she displays it in the book. So this evening's books, we'll be looking at The Pillar from Stephen Gill and Ravens by Masahasi Fukazi. And the books, they're different in a few ways, but they do share a theme, um, perhaps an obsession. And we'll discuss how the artists approach the, each subject. Um, so I'm gonna start this evening by looking at the pillar. And I'm gonna show you quite a few photos from the book, um, but I'm not gonna show you all of the pictures because you know the hope is that you will become interested enough in the book to try and seek it out and maybe purchase it or, or look at it in the library or something like that. But before I really get into the pillar, I think it's worth mentioning Stephen Gill's previous book, which is Night Procession. And this book was published in 2017 and it was immediately before his book, The Pillar. And in this work, um, Stephen Gill placed cameras fitted with motion sensors in areas where he expected animals to appear at night. And the resulting images allow us into the private world of the creatures who ventured into the frame. And the lo-fi aesthetic of some of the images in, in this book are quite similar to those in the pillar. And the book design is consistent as well. Um, you can see that there's consistency there. Um, so this is an excerpt, uh, this is text actually that Stephen Gill wrote with, with regards to night procession. And when we read the text, we can, we can see that he is an observer of life. And if we look at some of his other, his other works, um, we know that he's an observer of life. And he says, on my many walks, I soon came to realize that this new apparently bleak, flat and open landscape was in fact teeming with intense life. Small clues appeared during daylight hours that helped me to understand the extent of activity during the night. Clusters of feathers, animal footprints of all sizes, showing regular overlapping roots, gnawed branches, eggshells, and hills, nibbled mushrooms and busy snails and slugs, working through the feast provided from the previous night. And he goes on. I started to imagine the creatures in absolute darkness on the forest floor, driven by instincts and their will to survive. I imagined them encountering each other. I thought of their eyes, near redundant in the thick of the night, and their sense of smell and hearing finely tuned and heightened. So not only is he an observer of life, but he's also a storyteller. Okay, so um, the work or the images in this book were shot between December 2015 and January 2019. And the book was published in January 2019. And the book has images from Stephen Gill. Sorry, I just need to let some people in. Um, yes, so uh, the book was published in 2019 and it includes the images from Stephen Gill and an essay from Carl Uwe Knausgård. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And um, when I first picked up the book, the design and the weight and the feel of the book, this is the book here, it kind of reminded me of an old encyclopedia, you know, the kind of thing that I'd look for as a child. Um, and, you know, you pour through it and you look at the pictures, it has that kind of feel, even, even, I don't know if you can see that, but even the edges are starting, I've only had it a couple of weeks, and the edges are starting to kind of look worn, and the spine is a little bit skewed and it just feels like an old encyclopedia um and then we get to the end papers and the end papers look like they're prints of the actual pillar um so to add context what stephen gill did he he got a pillar and he he um drove the pillar into the ground and i think it's probably three foot high quite small in diameter and then opposite that he put in another pillar of the same dimensions, and then he mounted a motion sensor camera on top of that pillar. And the, the printing 
on the end papers is kind of consistent with Gil's haptic approach to image making. Um, and he likes to get his hands involved. There's lots of different projects that he's worked on where he's become involved physically in the work. Um, and then we open the book and there's the title page with a dedication to his family. And then the first image. And we see a pillar located in a rural winter scene um, with the horizon shielded uh, by mist. And we can just make out a narrow ditch running along the edge of the frame there. And this initial image, it sets the scene for every picture that follows because we're always gonna be looking from the same vantage point at that pillar. And then there's another total page oh, yeah. with a credit to the essay writer and the, uh, the name of the publisher there, which is Gil's own publisher. Sorry, there's more people here. Um, and then the first picture of the bird. So it's the second picture in the book and it's the first picture featuring the bird and immediately the book springs to life. Sorry, I'm still admitting people. Um, and then the next picture, we see a common buzzard and it's kind of looking quizzically at the camera there. And then the sequence with the same breed of bird. Um, and we sense a shift in time and that's due to the fresh snowfall. So we can see the stream on the left and then we're looking again. And even though there's some repetition there, we can tell that there's been a passing of time because we have freshly laid snow. And then a picture of an owl. And immediately we start to see that the um, images, they appear playful with the birds, the protagonists in this unfolding drama. And then in some images, we notice the landscape um, in different weather conditions. And sometimes depending on the, on the weather, there's more information visible in the scene. And then other visitors may enter as well. So it's, there's, there's a lot of um, chance, I suppose, as well, because the buzzard set the camera off and it just so happened that there was some deer in the field as well. Um, and there we have another buzzard. And then a book. Now, I'm looking at these, the design of the book and it's a fairly classical design where we have, we have the image on one page and then we have the empty space on, on, the other, on the other page, the opposing page. And there's a small number here. And that number refers to an index in the back. So you can actually check the species of the birds. And as I venture further into the book, I find myself starting to obsess over what type of bird has been photographed. And I think that echoes Stephen Gill's seemingly obsessive approach to photography. Um, and there we have another buzzard, maybe getting a bit agitated. And then we have the hindquarters of a goshawk. And this goshawk will appear later on in the book. And as I'm going through the pages, I'm beginning to connect with the birds and I'm wondering who will be visiting on the following page and what antics they will display. And the edit becomes increasingly intriguing as we witness the birds seemingly perform for the camera. And given our understanding of Gil's penchant for storytelling, oh. we can appreciate the mini narrative that's beginning to unfold here. And I'm being transported to this place a place which I probably never would have visited. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have spent as much time looking at the bird life in such an investigative way. Yet I am there with the birds and I'm, wit I'm witnessing their ablutions and their moments of sol solitary contemplation where they are seemingly unaware of my presence. And then others who may know I'm there, perhaps a little perturbed perturbed by the intrusion. And then am I intruding? Do, you know, do birds know that I'm there? Do they know that it's a camera? And I start to ask these questions. Uh, are they tired of my presence? Or are they simply intrigued? 
do they know I'm watching? There's so many questions that, that come to my mind as I'm turning the pages. And then some birds are just way too busy to stop. And as I start to notice that I'm projecting my human thoughts onto the birds in the images, I start to imagine their personalities. And I can't help it. Um, it's the way I'm conditioned, and perhaps that's due to the books I read when I was when I was small, or films I watched, in which the animals were kind of given voices and personas, and they sing songs. And at this point, I'm quite happy to be guided by my inner child, and thankful for the escapism that I'm afforded by the images in the book. And then I'm disappointed when there's no visitors. And I'm left to wonder who or what triggered the camera and why they didn't stay. And then I'm followed by surprise with a mouse which takes the center of our view. And then I start to reflect upon the cruelty of nature and perhaps a little sorrow for the small mammal which has been preyed upon by its cash pool. And now the buzzard is simply showing off. And, you know, you're getting to see birds from different angles that you, you might not necessarily see them from in, in close range as well. Um, you can see the muscles on, on, the, on the legs and you can sense the power. And then I think back to the mouse and the terror that that mouse must have felt when it noticed the shadow looming over before hearing the beating wings of this powerful bird and then the talons which pierced its skin. And then spring comes and we're offered a flourish of colour and then the fashion parade, parade begins with the Kestrel Queen in here, fanning out his glorious feathers. And then we're faced with fabulous feathered frock of a white-tailed eagle. And then maybe a touch of mystery as our buzzard friend coyly shields his face. And then there's the goshawk looking elegant and is it posturing right before us? And in the, in the essay, um, he mentions the goshawk in the essay. And he says, on one occasion when I visited Stephen Gill, it must have been the last, the last summer, I remember standing in the farmyard, a hazy sky, the warmth of, in the air, the pillar about a kilometre away with the camera, presumably photographing birds as we talked. And he told me about a pair of wood pigeons that were nesting in a tree on the property. And the same pair had come there four years running, building their nest, laying eggs, hatching them, feeding their young, who had quickly grown in size. And every year, just before the young reached the fledgling age, the goshawk had come and taken them. And the following spring, the pair would return, lay new eggs, feed new young, only for the goshawk hawk to come and take them again days before they were ready to flee the nest and strangely this didn't stop the pair from returning the following two years as well laying their eggs and feeding their young again in the very same place and with the very same result and each time the goshawk came and it took them and he writes that the story is a gruesome one for not only did the wood pigeons lose all their young in the first spring but they kept coming back and they expose themselves to the same danger again, and not just once, but three times over, in each case, knowing what would happen or with their eyes open. And he says that this they could only do actually because they lack any conception of past or future, living their lives wholly and fully in the now. And in the now, there is no goshawk. In the now is the nest, the eggs, the sun, the leaves, the tree, the warm air, the sounds drifting up from below, hunger, thirst, the overwhelming instinct that compels them to feed their screeching young. And from the viewpoint of the wood pigeons, their life is no tragedy. They are, on the contrary, joyful, he writes. Listen to how they coo, see how busily they seek food for their hungry chicks. And this, this raises questions around exist existentialism. Um, and do animals really live in the moment? I mean, we can only infer that we don't know. Um, for example, cows, do cows mourn the loss of their calves? I've read accounts of elephants burying their dead with grass. 
and so uh, animals, uh, mammals, different to birds. And then what about homing pigeons? You know, do homing pigeons not remember from where they came, so they can come back? And carrier pigeons, who are used to throwing messages over distance. So I'm not sure um, how I, how that sits with me. Maybe we can discuss that. And in the next in the next frame, we don't see a bird, just a fox scavenging. And I'm still thinking about: is the fox living in the moment? And are the animals of the land different to those of the air? And how do they experience the world differently? And can we can we ever really know? Um, and then I'm wondering who triggered the camera. Perhaps the figure, the truck, the fox, sorry, <laughs> triggered both the camera and the absence on the post. And also, how did he get so far into the frame before the shutter was released? Things that I'm considering here. And then we get to witness the aerodynamic departure of a bird and a split second, possibly a sight that can only be captured on camera. And then a red kite shouts in our face. And then what are the starlings up to? We're still left to wonder. And then it's night time. And is there someone here? Then frolicking rooks who venture a bit too close to the camera. And then we see a party trick. And then some showing out. And then the marsh harrier comes and has a look. And a splendid heron creates a wonderful composition, an, ana an analysis of beauty, a serpentine line Hogarth would be proud of. And then it's almost comical. And <laughs> am I being played here? And then again, the stillness of the empty pillar. And the color images, there's a few color images which are kind of interspersed throughout the work. And the palette's kind of Turner-esque. Um, and it, it helps to, to image a kind of painterly scene. And then the book continues with an amazing array of images as different birds continue to visit the pillar. And the book is absolutely captivating. And we witness 24 different species in all who visit the pillar. And then there's a device which shows, slows us down, which is a cave fault. And it's really the only device. Um, there's some double spreads which make us pause, I suppose. Um, but the only real device that I could get uh, that would slow me down is the gatefold here. And then we get to witness the bird preening itself in front of us. And then it's followed by a scene and the bird on the left can see which, that which we don't. It sees behind us and it's another bird approaching and we don't know if it's a friend or a foe and we're left wondering. And then some strange light evoking a sense of something moving rapidly and a frenetic scene before calmness is restored. And then I'm wondering, is it the end of the world? And no, we're constantly reminded of the ebbs and flows of life around the pillar and the changing seasons and the variety of wildlife that exists in one small area. And it's quite remarkable. And then the seasons come and go, the harmers, the humans bomb the land and the birds carry on regardless. And then the cycle repeats and the cycle repeats and the cycle repeats. And then as we come towards the end of the book and we, we get ready to say farewell, we're left to ponder whether the pillar is still there today and who will stop by. And there's nothing tempting the birds to the pillar. There's no food and there's no water only its existence. And Stephen Gill writes, the landscape that surrounds my home in Sweden can be misleading. The bird activity it contains is diluted by the vastness of the flat open land and sky. Okay. Which, which gives the impression <laughs> that going on. Uh, nee, das soll du dich noch machen. In January 2015, with the inkling of an idea, that their activity might be more prevalent than I first thought, I decided to try to pull the birds from the sky on the edge of a field next to the street. I'm just going to move that person. 
On the edge of the field next to a stream, I set up a centimeter diameter <sighs> stage in the form of a wall, about one and a half meters high. And the type stone. Obviously, I placed another of the same size on which I mounted a motion sensor camera where I, when I visited the camera a few days later, to my surprise, it had worked. And when I read the text, I'm kind of reminded of the field of dreams and the line, if you build it, they will come. And the willingness of the farmer and his endeavor to create something special in the hope that something magical will happen. And Stephen Gill made something special and they came and they performed and it, it is magical. And on that note, I will stop sharing. Um, Elinka, if you would like to. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, funny, I was gonna talk about how the book that the next book we're gonna see is, is not actually as dark as everyone uh, seems to believe, but after looking at your book, Richard, <laughs> I'm having some second thoughts. Um, but yeah, the second book we're gonna, second work we're gonna look at today um, let me just do this. Okay, one second. Can you see okay? Um, so this is Ravens by Masahi Masahisa Fukase. Um, the volume that I'm talking about was published by Mac in 2017, and I have it just here. Um, and you should know that it's an it's an exact copy of the very first edition of this volume, um, which was published in Japan in 1986. So it's a bilingual edition as well, um, and it has around 125 uh, photos as well as two essays. Uh, the first essay is by uh, Akira Hasegawa, who is the photo editor of uh, an influential uh, photo magazine where this work was actually published uh, before it was gathered in book form. So it was published uh, regularly in this magazine, um, as well as a text by Tomo Kosuga, who's the founder of the uh, Masahisa Fukase archive. Uh, this archive was founded in uh, 2014. There's a very good website where you can access a lot of information about the photographer and, and his work. Um, and it's considered by Kosuka and by many uh, to be one of the defining bodies of work in the history of photography. Uh, and uh, he says a high po point in the photo book genre. Um, and I certainly, uh, agree it's a really wonderful volume you can see here um how it looks this is black linen it's rather uh heavy as well um and it has this embossed shape of a of a raven on the front and that's also the very first photo that you see in the book so it's kind of echoed in this way um interrupt yeah, uh, you're not showing. You're not showing the full. You're not running the slideshow. <laughs> okay, it's good to know. How about now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um. Yes. So. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the photographer. Um, he was born in 1934 in Hokkaido. Uh, and his family had a photography studio, which meant that he was around photography for all of his life. Um, and he went on to study photography in Tokyo when he was 18 and never really returned to live back home or to work for the family business, which was the, the photography studio, um, but went on to be to, to make his own work and to live also from um, commercial photography. Um, and a lot of his uh, life was, uh, personal life was rather tumultuous. He struggled a lot with um, 
alcoholism, bouts of violence, loneliness, divorces, loss of children, and so on. And he's photographed uh, a lot of this um, as well. So there are bodies of work that are very personal and that involve his um, wife or his family. Um, and although this work that I'm going to show you some images from in a second is much more ambiguous and it's called Ravens, um, although it is uh, yeah, so much more ambiguous than the much more personal work that he's done before and after, it's still considered to be very much a, a self-portrait or, or there's a lot of ways in which this work has been linked to kind of biographical details. Uh, almost obsessively in the way that it's kind of foreshadowed his own um, rather tragic life. Um, and I should tell you also that he died in 2012 after being in a coma for 20 years. Um, he fell from the top of the stairs in a pub where he was at that point had been drinking every night for years. And um, yeah, so he had this tragic end, so there's a lot of uh, insistence of, of, of seeing his dark work as somehow foreshadowing uh, all these details of his personal life, which to some degree, of course, is the case. At the same time, it's quite interesting to look at the work as a, um, just in the way that it plays uh, with different elements to make maybe a, a more abstract point uh, or, or a more just in the way he experiments with narrative more generally and with photography. So um, I'm gonna show you some photos of the ravens that give the title to the book. Um, the ones that you see here are uh, on the white background are the first three photos in the book after the image you just saw earlier. Um, and then later in the book, the one in, the one with the flock um, from a from a distance uh, appears. So I just find it very. Um, I found it interesting the the that he really tried to capture these birds in many different ways, and he played a lot of with um, shapes and abstraction and the way in which he used for telephoto lens or like crop the birds really closely, but somehow this kind of desire to get close only made the image more abstract and more kind of out of reach. Um, and it, it's almost more an interest in the forms and the shape rather than uh, you know the behavior of, of birds or anything like that. It's kind of highly, yeah. And then they're very spe spectral, ghostly, um, I, I find, and this interest in the sh in shapes and then these sh shapes kind of changing and morphing, you can also see um, in the next little bit in the book, uh, which is uh, this one here, where he photographed a cloud and then some some people, but with with this kind of same interest in the ways in which shapes um, appear or disappear, or they're caught in, in kind of this state of transition more than uh, in any descriptive way. So it's very, uh, yeah, there's a clear interest in mood, you know, over kind of technical, uh, uh, any technical thing. Well, I guess this is um, a different kind of, technical achievement. It's yeah, just very, for me, very touching. Um, and I, yeah, I hope that for all, for all the kind of focus on the way in which the work, yes, it's kind of dark. Um, I find that he had a, quite a clear interest in light and or, or maybe in half light or, uh, the way and he really tried to capture, I like particularly in this image that's the one on its own, where you can see he almost tried to photograph the light itself or just the way it, uh, you know, dissipates into the atmosphere. There's no subject as such there apart from just the light. Um, and it has also like kind of a snapshot feel or some of them do. Um, 
and then the one in the, at the top there is almost has a movement to it and you can see a little light which is uh, the window of a house I suppose and also then an interest in photographing the the sun through this through these clouds uh, of smoke and the clouds in the background as well um, so I think from here uh, you know I was looking at the birds yes and then I was looking at the way that the light uh, comes across in the photos and also his interest in all of these different substances or materials that are kind of um, you know like mist and smoke and light and um, so here I found a really nice uh, um, quote from him about the moment when he wanted to he realized that he can only ever photograph these birds at sunset or sunrise and he wasn't entirely confident that that would work but um, went and used the flashlight to capture uh, the birds and it says uh, he says the results were splendid I like the effect birds caught in flight glistened with a dark sheen and the eyeballs of those on the trees sparkled this is perhaps one of my favorite photographs from the book as well um, and you can see that the tiny uh, eyes of the birds just uh, sparkling there and then here on the left is another example of this kind of these kind of experiments of using flash in the night but much more abstract um, and I found it to to kind of relate back to images like the one of the house. So kind of just isolating little light, little lights, but whether that's the uh, light from a window or that of a bird, uh, you know, it still creates this formal correspondence that kind of makes a very interesting confusion between the different kinds of uh, forms and life forms. And then again, uh, this interest in matter or all of this gooey wet uh, veils that he could find around. Um, all of the photographs in the book are taken in Tokyo, Hokkaido, uh, or I forget the name of the place, but uh, still close to that area, which, is, which was his ex-wife's um, hometown. So I should say that the series kind of started with him mourning uh, the loss of, well, the divorce separation from his second wife um, and uh, Yoko, who he's photographed for 13 years. Um, and there's a, an important body of work of his called Yoko. Um, and I think, yes, a lot of this work has been thought of in relation to that kind of personal trauma. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I think that, that yes, he was uh, upset and was kind of roaming around these places that they had visited together um, in the hope of finding some sense of healing. But at the same time, this work went on, he made it over seven years, I think. And it kind of changed and his obsession with ravens became more prominent and but I thought it was interesting I all of these photographs are there there are no double spreads in the book so you just see them one after the other but as you look back and forward you realize there are these really beautiful correspondences so here you know you have the the water the raindrops and then the snow and the, the smoke and the bird just appearing over there through the smoke um, and punctuating these rather indistinct hazy images, there are these uh, very striking photographs. Uh, at the top there is a dead raven and then a very menacing cat and then a decomposing fish. I was trying to make sense of these because they do kind of stand out as rather different from the rest of the work, but I feel like in a sense, um, he's still circling around this idea of 
decomposition decayed the solution. Um, but at this time, in a, perhaps in a more literal sense. And then there's also, for me, the clarity of these photos makes them also quite abstract, just in the context of the, the larger sequences. Um, and apart from the visual correspondences, like the little lights I was talking about, there's a way in which he creates this rhythm in the book. So this is a, an example of uh, three photos that come one after the other. And in the first one, um, you can kind of just make out the wings of this raven in the snow. Uh, then the, the tracks uh, that the bird left in the snow. And then the, I really love the way in which this next photograph was the bird that was covered in snow. So it was for me almost a way in which, a, a very effective way to show the way that these uh, are in, that the bird and the snow are entangled. Uh, in a kind of an abstract way um, that photography can do, that it can really interrelate through these visual formal correspondences. It can make these bodies of both, you know, birds, flesh, smoke, water, snow, all kind of seem uh, very much of, of, you know, states of matter in flux or something like that. And there's uh, here you can also see quite clearly how he does how he does mirror um, images. So how this the kind of steam on the water and then the light on the water uh, produce a similar effect and it's a similar composition too. And then uh, the one of someone's hair flying in the wind is also echoed a little bit in those photographs of the clouds and the flight of the the birds as well, of course. Um, and I'm gonna see if I think there's time to show you also this last one. So these are the, the last four photographs in the book, which again, I think take, take uh, this idea of uh, exploding, imploding matter, I don't know. Uh, chaos and fragments and decomposition. Uh, so in, there on the left, you see the teeth of a, an excavator and some kind of debris flying in the air. Uh, and then there's a man on his own in the middle of uh, a Tokyo park and some cherry blossoms in the background some gloves on fire uh, and then the very last image is of a here of a man with a, ba a, a blanket of sorts just walking on the streets of Tokyo. Um, so yeah it's a rather enigmatic ending but it's also in, in uh, tune with the other pictures and the book. It's a very, it works a lot, it kind of leaves a lot of space for making associations, both visual and um, for me, not so much symbolic as almost about the very kind of uh, substances and elements of existence. It's very physical somehow. That's why I wasn't all that satisfied with a reading of this book with the raven being a metaphor or foreshadowing or because for me there was just a lot of it that despite being quite ghostly presences there is a way in which they really are entangled with very physical matter at many points in the book. Um, so here um, you can see that, that the first and last images in the book that I've just put together so you can kind of get a sense. There's a lot of, there are essays as well written with this title of Becoming Raven about the book. I'm gonna share some links with you because they're rather nice texts. 
um, that give a good context and interviews as well with with people in who who knew him and and knew the work. Um, but yeah, perhaps uh, for me, the idea of becoming Raven was not so much the way that that came across for me was the in in the very interesting the, I, I think that despite it being perhaps a very personal work, there's no singular uh, perspective that you can cling to for the whole of the work. And it almost seems kind of disembodied um, or, you know, some have argued it's almost from the perspective of a raven. Uh, it definitely doesn't feel often like there's a person there. It feels like it's kind of you know, just another presence uh, kind of floating around. So it's a very interesting human, but also non-human perspective, I think, that comes across in the book. And in a way, links to um, the pillar where there's also no human or or it's a you know it's a bit like those night cameras that people put in the forest uh that then capture things and so you're kind of left wondering where the the human perspective uh, lies exactly or or just how much of it is mutable i think i think that's a good point actually link at you know how do we attach meaning to images <clears throat> and it's, it's it's probably down to conditioning <clears throat> and our life experiences and, and you know and the, the images we've looked at in the past and um that that picture of the homeless man with the with the um duvet kind of draped over his shoulders for me it kind of evokes the feeling of a, of a raven with its wings kind of just dragging along the ground um and i think i read somewhere it might have been in one of those essays about ravens having some kind of association in folklore to homeless people or, or travellers or something like that. Um, okay, so we'll open it up now. If anybody has anything that they want to say, if anything that they want to, if they have a different perception of any of the works that we've shown um, on either book. Um, obviously, I looked at it from a purely subjective perspective. I'd love to hear if anybody has different ideas or thoughts on either of the books. You can either unmute or you can um, put it in the chat. Um, can I just make a comment, Richard? Yep. Um, I suppose when um, <clears throat> I was looking at, uh, <clears throat> at uh, the pillar, um, what really came to mind was a quote by um, Uta Barth, who's a German photographer, and when she talks about her art practice, she says, the question for me always is, how can I make you aware of your own looking instead of losing your attention to thoughts about what it is you're looking at? And I suppose that was the one thing that really struck me when I was um, looking at um, um, the pillar. You know, normally it's like I'm sort of really observed in sort of the content of what, what's been photographed or, you know, things like that. Whereas me being an, the observer or almost being the, in place of the camera really struck me. So it was just, I just wanted to share that comment. Yeah, I think that's an interesting observation. I mean, um, there, there's, a, there's a really old film, The Man with the Movie Camera, where he says, I am the eye or something like that. <clears throat> And I suppose it speaks to that, you know, we are that eye, that camera um, on that post opposite those birds. And I was kind of playing there with um, with ascribing characteristics to these birds. In the essay, um, he's saying something completely different. He's saying that, <clears throat> you know, the birds, they're, they're animals, they they kind of, they're, they're in the moment um, and anything that we know about them is not very much. Um, but with um, ravens, certainly you get, you get a feeling of transition. I think he took a load of those photos from the train maybe um, when he was commuting. 
Mm, I, I'm not sure exactly, but there are definitely some images like the one with the house and the little light on. I, to me, that looks like it could be taken from from a, from a yeah, moving train, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and then with the pillar, we, we have nothing else. We only have that, that one view and that, and that bird or whatever comes into the frame. So it's, it's a kind of interesting perspective. You know, we're always there and we're always looking at that, just, just that one view, waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, anybody else have anything that they'd like to add? Um, I think there's someone in the chat uh, just saying that uh, looking at the pillar, I think that although uh, Gil set up the camera and the pillar in a certain spot, he wasn't in control of the images as it was up to the birds and other animals, how the images would be composed. Uh, they took control of the images while he took control of the body of work as a whole by making it into a book. Yeah, that's interesting. So we're, so we're talking about him editing the images. I suppose with with that comment, um, you know, I'd love to see the full edit. How many? How many? There must be tons and tons of pictures. Um, and I guess he, he he chose the the edit which spoke to him or conveyed the the story or the narrative that he was that he was intending to show us. Um, and the question about whether the birds actually know and whether they're performing for the camera is the you know is the big question, isn't it? Um, you know, that's the existential question, I suppose. Okay. Um, there's, um, there's a divine association with the raven in Japan, so it's associated with divine intervention in human affairs. So I think it's interesting in the context of grief, and I think Amaterasu, who's kind of the origin myth of the Japanese people, I think was said to have turned into a raven or had the ability to turn into a raven at one point as well. So again, sort of interesting in the sense of the, the creation and the taking away of life, I suppose. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose then we, we start to think about the raven and its association in literature and, and in folklore as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think in, in a lot of cultures which I'm aware of, ravens are associated with death. Um, they they eat dead they eat carrion they eat dead things, um, dead and decaying flesh, um, and um, and in other in other cultures, um, they're seen as bad luck in Greek mythology. I think they were a sign of bad luck. Um, so they actually, they actually feature on the on the just trivia but they feature on the the japanese football shirt still to this day part of the logo is actually a raven so and, and cool. is that associated to this work do you think <laughs> that's that's highly unlikely <laughs> <laughs> i'd say it's associated to some large sports company probably maybe oh, right, okay. but um but it is part of the logo which i think is kind of interesting because you know if, if it does have that association with death it's maybe not what you want uh, yeah. from, from a victory point of view, but certainly, um, yeah, it just it, it, it <laughs> seems to run through the culture quite heavily. Yeah, that's a good point. And then obviously, we 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 um, we've seen ravers in, in movies and things like that, um, and in Shakespeare as well in Macbeth. Um, I think um, you know the ravens or the crows in in, the, in that um, story they're associated with death as well, and uh, the birds from Hitchcock. So it comes with all kinds of connotations, and I suppose it depends what we've been exposed to. Um. <clears throat> I think, yeah, there's certainly a sense in which the, um, you know, the ravens are an ill omen. Um, I thought it was interesting in, in a way that he was seeking out these birds as a way to heal. So the idea that they would be foreshadowing something or um, also that he, the fact that he includes two photographs of dead ravens, I feel like takes a little bit away from their power as just mere symbols. Mm -hmm. um, if if those two photos wouldn't be there, then perhaps you could read all the other photographs in the light of these more abstract um, ravens that populate the book. But those two images of the of the dead ravens, I think, add kind of a different, just a little. Yeah, different nuance yeah. as well. 
I think when I'm, when I'm thinking about the two books now, I'm thinking about how much they reflect on the state of mind of both of the artists. For example, um, we mentioned the transition of ravens and you can see that there's movement and in the pillar it's static. So the pillar is driven into the ground, it's stable. And I wonder if that kind of reflects on Stephen Gill's own personal life. There, there may be some stability in his life. We know that he's got a family out there because we saw it in the credits. So we can start to piece things together. Um, whereas um, the Ravens book, it feels, I don't know, it, it has, the, for me, it has this kind of um, more unsettled feeling when I'm, when I'm going through the pages. Okay, um, anybody else want to say anything before we end? Because I think we're almost at the hour here. Okay, Alinka, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Um, someone in the chat is just saying that the pillar is a more conceptual way of, of photographing. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's certainly taking one concept and kind of seeing what, what its logical conclusion might be, whereas Ravens is a lot more intuitive, um, perhaps. But yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks for everyone, uh, to everyone in the comments as well. Um, yeah, OK, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to hit end now. It always ends very quickly. So goodbye, everybody.